Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, Jan, Carrie, and Lita, Leah, for that beautiful song to start us off. This is a story about shoes. These shoes. In sixth grade, exactly 10 years ago, I saved up my allowance and designed my own Converse high tops on the Converse website. Lime green, turquoise, and purple, with my name in white sewn on the back stripe. I followed the UPS tracking devotedly. I even crafted a calendar counting down the days till they'd arrive on our doorstep. I was thrilled to see they came in two and a half weeks instead of the predicted three to five. And I wore them with utmost pride every day. A couple of months later, we began planning my bat mitzvah, and I was adamant that everything from our handmade invitations to the home-baked cupcakes also had to be lime green, turquoise, and purple. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I got my wish. <laughs> You're probably wondering why I've shared with you this tidbit of my sixth grade year. But to know me in sixth grade, to know me in those converse, to know the girl who was unyielding when it came to her bat mitzvah color scheme, that is to know me. To know what I've made is to know me. When I graduated sixth grade in our yearbook baby ads, my parents wrote, you've always marched to the beat of your own drummer. And those converse became the shoes in which I'd march. By the time my bat mitzvah arrived, they no longer fit me. Yet I believe that the ubiquitous power of authenticity was forever stitched within those special sneakers. They were first an emblem of my creativity and later a motif for our human capacity to realize that when we reside in spaces that no longer serve us, that no longer validate us, that no longer root us or fit us, we can walk away. For much of my high school years, I felt stuck, stuck metaphorically in spaces where I felt like I had to conform, where I was otherwise pegged as the different one, the one who likes to read, the granola one, the Jewish one, <laughs> when I wasn't even claiming those individualities for myself. My sixth grade self in sneakers certainly do not fit me anymore, and it would be a shame for my feet to try and contort themselves in a way to occupy that smaller space. Why can't I apply the same logic as I grew over the next 10 years? In what ways was I twisting the elements of my being to fit a mold, a place, or an idea? I'm speaking about the molds others put us into, but today I'd love to focus my talk on two identities, two labels that I, for so long, have struggled to claim as my own, being an artist and being a leader. These two labels are often linked to molds and ideas that we've established in our society, and I believe that they can sometimes be pretty narrow. Ever since I can remember, I have loved to create. I used to let rainwater collect in an old red wheelbarrow, throw in monkey grass and sticks, the spices, take a serving spoon from the kitchen, and then make a recipe, mix it all together for my favorite recipe of outdoor, inconsumable soup. I will let you know that those cooking passions did not translate into my adulthood. <laughs> but I suppose my first real creative loves were writing and drawing. One night at dinner, around age 10, I told my parents I wanted to change the world. By writing a book, a very humble, unpretentious ambition that I fashioned out loud as I swirled spaghetti around my fork. I took art classes and wrote stories and found that what I loved most of all was imaginatively expressing myself. Art was a conduit for which my most authentic self could be seen. At the same time though, it has felt all too easy to compare my drawings or stories to that of someone else. Because I believe art is one of the most vulnerable things that we do. And there's an inherent emotional risk in that creativity. Since I can remember in elementary school art classes and beyond, feelings of scarcity in comparison would often flush their stealthy plots into my brain. Just in college, there are so many times I have wanted to drop my communication design major, not because I didn't love the classes, but because I didn't feel that my work was good enough, or more plainly, that I was good enough. A glance around the classroom when we presented our projects 
in a room of such creativity and ingenuity sent forth an uncomfortable gulp of others' talent and a sentiment of my own unworthiness. I still continue to work through those feelings of inadequacy. I am still trying to wean myself off of the need of external validation and praise. Last summer, I found a line in our synagogue prayer book called the Sidur that started to shift those internal gears. It read, the creation of the world is not yet complete until you have fulfilled your creative function in it. The creation of the world is not yet complete until you have fulfilled your creative function in it. This revelation reframed everything for me. It inspired me to continue showing up to the palette, to the pen, to every allegorical canvas. Why was I still shadowed by the fear of pursuing exactly what I was meant to do in this world? Why do any of us live in the debilitating fear of what we are meant to create? After all, if we constantly live in fear of the story, our own story, we never get to write it. I believe we are all artists, whether that is in a journal, in the kitchen, on the dance floor, or in the ways in which we love others. For me, art is my advocacy, my vulnerability, my authenticity, my voice, my purpose. And so I ask, what is art for you? Now on to that other identity, being a leader. Even saying that word, my mind promptly fills of the people I have imagined I can never be. Think the Obamas, Mandela, Malala, the ones who write those world-changing books that I spoke of when I was 10. The movers, the shifters, the change agents whose appellations are as etched into society as anyone's can be. Growing up, I was one of the last to be picked to be leader of the day. I was the least authoritative person I knew. I wasn't loud, I couldn't get people's attention, and leader wasn't really a title my peers gave me. In fact, calling myself a leader felt like putting on a coat that was two sizes too big. It was uncomfortable and ill-fitting, just waiting to slip off at any moment and reveal the truth, that I wasn't really a leader at all. I constantly look around and see the people who were louder or smarter or more commanding, who wore leadership like it was a continually affixed outfit accessory. In my college essay, I wrote about my breakthrough on defining myself as a leader after I went on a backpacking trip. It still felt phony, inauthentic. Fast forward four years, and I applied to an Elon Leadership Honor Society. I was not accepted. I found myself upset. After all these years at my college finale, was I still not a leader? I then found myself upset that I was dismayed to begin with. Why did I care what someone didn't see in a few bullets or essays? I want to read you part of my application that didn't get me in because I still stand by it. I said, one day, I had my own internal epiphany. Leader, L-E-A-D-E-R, L-E-A-D, lead. A leader is someone who leads people towards something. And if I've led someone, even just one person, towards joy, I have done my job. We all have the capacity to lead others towards something. Is it hope? Is it art? Is it light? Here at Elon, I have seen my mentors lead people to growth, to profounder understandings of the interconnectedness of humankind, to greater cultural humility and greater compassion. That's the kind of leader I want to be. And so I ask, what are you leading others to? That's what I wrote for one of my essays. And while it's a journey, this is much more of a definition I can see my authentic self in, because it's mine. Yet what still stops us from claiming an identity is fear. I think one of my deepest fears that ties into my reluctance to claim these identities as my own is the fear of being ordinary. I believe many of us may hold this untold angst, this ineffable unease, that at our core, we may be unremarkable. For me, I feel like I'd be letting people down if I don't live up to some sort of potential that either they have spoken into my life or I have etched out in my mind. We've internalized this crushing perception of normality. Leaders aren't ordinary. 
artists aren't ordinary, and this fear of not being enough, of being unremarkable, is a curbing belief that keeps us stuck in shoes and places that don't fit us anymore. But what does ordinary even mean? I want you to imagine you're driving past a neighborhood street at night, homes stretched out along the road, illuminated by indoor lamps. That subtle light that streams from each window feels like any ordinary scene. But what if it was really the visible expression of the golden flares that harbor our own authentic and intricate lives, as complex and beautiful as our neighbors' equally floodlit homes, that when we feel safe and brave in, we let people into? What if that scene was simultaneously ordinary and extraordinary? Maybe being an artist, a leader, whatever label you've struggled to cling closer to, is simply residing in the gray space between ordinary and extraordinary. Both artists and leaders pulse into the human experience to extract the fibers of our being that are open to transformation. Perhaps they are not so much two separate identities, but one collective identity. I think for me, art is my conduit for leadership. Artists are leaders, leaders are artists. They create space and experiences that most closely resemble what it feels like to be human. They are magnets, lightning bolts, mechanisms that harness social, emotional electricity and keep it flowing. They give us space to dream. Today, I want to create a space for all of us to dream. You've probably noticed the little pieces of paper that were on your chairs. After this speech, or any time you feel called to, I invite you to make your personal declaration, an affirmation of who you are or who you're becoming. It starts with I am, and the three or four adjectives and nouns that follow are all yours. It can be a foundation, a framework, a compass to point you to your most true north. I invite you to put that paper in a place you'll see often, like your wallet, a reminder of your authentic identities worth, and gifts. The tangibility of your own writing is so empowering. So perhaps your personal declaration is most encapsulated by this question. What is it that you wish to walk through this world radiating? It still feels hard to tack on those identities of artist and leader to my being. In many ways, it still feels foreign, but I am practicing. For I want to feel the joy, wonder, and liberation of fully owning who I am. It can feel particularly hard on the days where I don't feel like I'm an artist or leader at all. But today is April 18th, 2019, exactly 10 years after April of 2009, when I rushed outside to the UPS truck to retrieve my colorful converse. In some ways, it feels like yesterday, and in other ways, a lifetime ago, that I chased my authenticity with the same fervor that underlined each step down the road for that shiny box of sneakers. So I stand here in front of you all, metaphorically filling out my personal declaration, claiming a few identities I know to be mine, at least today, on this April 18th, 2019. And I also want to give deep gratitude for the Truett Center for believing in me, even when I didn't believe in me. So I leave you with this. I am an artist. I am a leader, and I, like all of us here, am intermittently extraordinary and brilliantly ordinary. Thank you.